So today for lecture five, I want to uh, set science free. Uh, so this is actually from the fourth section of, the, of my book, uh, Setting God Free. So the four sections of the book were initially setting psychology free. So we know how we know what we know. And then the second, second section was setting God free, holding a trial and finding him innocent of the crimes that we've attributed to him. And uh, yesterday I dealt a lot with uh, setting uh, spirituality free, which was the third part of the book. And today I'm going to focus on setting science free and then putting the whole lot together again. And so the first thing is to just unravel the word science. We have this notion that somehow science is a very modern invention. The word science from the Latin, scientia, just literally means knowledge. And so people have been scientists since the very, very beginning, since they first opened their eyes and started trying to figure out uh, what was around them. So science basically is just the pursuit of knowledge. Now, you don't need to be a guy in a, in a white coat, you know, with um, uh, microscopes and telescopes in, in order to be a scientist. Anybody who's interested in understanding their environment is ipso facto a scientist. And science then is just the pursuit of knowledge. So I distinguish then between the pursuit of knowledge and the pursuit of wisdom. And so people who kind of mock mythology and kind of uh, uh, divinize science, they don't understand either mythology or science. Because science is literally the pursuit of knowledge in the, kind of the, in the cosmos with a little c. Uh, when the Greeks spelled cosmos with a C, they meant the physical universe. When they spelled cosmos with a K, they meant the metaphysical universe. And so science is the pursuit of understanding the physical universe in which we find ourselves, and wisdom is understanding the metaphysical origins of the physical universe, because the physical universe is simply a hard copy or a printout of the, of the metaphysical. And so uh, it becomes really important for us then to understand that mythology is a very different kind of a pursuit. It's the pursuit of wisdom, and it's enshrined and archived basically in our stories and in our parables, metaphors, parables, etc. And so they go hand in glove with each other, just as the metaphysical and the, phys and the physical uh, go together. Now, like all great human endeavors, you know, the scientific model itself has, has evolved over time. From the very first caveman, you know, who understood that the heavier the kind of the shilele you had, the more damage you could do to an enemy's skull, you know, the law of the lever, literally. And so they've been we've been involving our knowledge uh, constantly. And so, like every system, it has had great achievements and has led to great blunders and great dangers, you know. So, in actual fact, if it weren't for our interest in in science, in kind of um, the pursuit of knowledge all religious wars would still be fought with sticks and stones. It was the scientific pursuit that allowed us to kind of create intercontinental ballistic missiles and biowarfare. And so science has got its, its upside and its downside, just exactly like every other human endeavor has and like religion has. So I spent some time yesterday focusing on the blunders, the mistakes and the sins of religion and how it has kind of uh, incarcerated us in many ways. Now, the same thing is true, the scientific pursuits. You know, that it has great, led to great achievements and it has made great blunders and great errors. So I'll try to balance my discussion of the scientific model uh, today by doing that. So yesterday I gave you my own understanding of what the scientific model, the most recent understanding, beginning, for instance, with maybe people like uh, Newton or even back further with Descartes, the understanding of the, uh, the scientific pursuit in any field of study goes through the, the following stages, I would suggest. There's first observations in the field of interest, then there's data gathering, then there's the kind of um, recognition of some kind of a possible pattern in your data, then there's a hypothesis that might explain this putative pattern, then there's the uh, empirical testing of your hypothesis. If it proves to be correct, you have to be sure it's not a statistical elaboration. Uh, so then you have to have other scientists, you know, replicate your study. And if a whole bunch of scientists come to the same conclusion, now you've got a principle in the field. You put together a bunch of principles and you have a model of the field. And so this model can accommodate all the scientific observations. And then at some stage, new anomalous data you may become apparent. And now you've got to kind of uh, tweak your model to accommodate the newer data. And at some stage, the old model is radically inadequate. And so you have to dismantle and abandon the old model and, and create a brand new model that can accommodate all the old data and all of the new anomalous data. And that's the kind of the genius of the scientific method. And I suggested yesterday that actually this has been uh, utilized even by the mystics going away, way back. But certainly it has been honed very skillfully 
uh, by the modern scientific method. Uh, I believe then that uh, there are five different stances that the scientific mind can take. Imagine you've got a speedometer with five positions on the speedometer and you're looking at a hypothesis or you're looking at kind of a theory and you're going to fall into one of five categories, I believe. The first one is innocence. There are some people and they believe anything you tell them, unquestionably, like a little child. You can tell them anything, the tooth fairy, Santa Claus, whatever, they believe it as fact. That's the first stance. The second stance is naivete. Now uh, you can you begin to ask some kinds of questions. You won't just accept everything blindly. You ask some questions that doesn't appear to make sense. But how did X happen? Whatever. So now there's naivete. That's the second level of it. The third one is critical thinking. And now you're going to ask really, really good questions, and you're not going to be satisfied with less than good answers. But you're open to data. You know, you're not closed to any possibility or any kind of data. The next one is the skeptic. And the skeptic is a very, very hard person to convince. No matter how much evidence you adduce, they're kind of sticking to their position. But if you adduce a lot of really great evidence, they'll agree. So Carl Sagan said famously at one time, uh, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary kind of evidence. So that would be the kind of the skeptical viewpoint. And then finally, you have the debunker. And the debunker is a scientific uh, fundamentalist, totally close to any data that contradict or question uh, his, his, his position right now. This is the kind of situation where one famous debunker at one stage said, uh, talking about psychology, he says, this is the kind of thing that even if it were true, I wouldn't believe it. And so that's the debunking. So obviously the perfect mindset is the critical thinking. Whether you're talking about religion or you're talking about the scientific theories that you have to stand here. You have to be open to the data and you have to lead where the data go. And therefore you have to kind of... Uh, uh, answer the, the the questions that arise from the, from the data that you're accumulating. So uh, I believe then that uh, the all human knowledge and wisdom is predicated on faith. And I'm going to kind of illustrate that now in, in a few moments. So typically we think that philosophy is the pursuit of knowledge via uh, logical induction and deduction. These are the tools of the philosophical inquiry. You've got induction and, and deduction. Induction is where you take a mass of data and you arrive at a principle. Deduction is where you start with a principle and then you apply it to a particular situation. So philosophy uses induction and, de and deduction logically to arrive at its version of truth. Science uses observation and experimentation in order to arrive at its uh, model of truth. Religion uses revelation and the claim that the uh, the scriptures tell us what the truth is, and then all subsequent data have to conform to our religious belief systems. So now we're going to massage the data until they conform to our pre-existing religious, religious notions. Now, there was a great debate then in the late Middle Ages in Latin between two statements. One of them said, credo ut intelligam, I believe in order that I may understand. And this was the religious beliefs thing. I believe, I accept the scriptures, and I believe it, in order that I may understand the world in which I live. And the opposite was, intelligo ut credem. I understand in order that I may believe. So it's that the antithesis of it. So one group is starting with a faith system and then forcing the data to conform to their faith system. And the other is depending upon intelligence and then saying, I will only believe what my intelligence tells me is the truth. So there are the two kind of uh, the typical stances from the Middle Ages on this was the kind of the, this was the football game. Now, I, I contend that every branch of human endeavor is radically based upon faith. And I'm going to give you a lot of examples. And the first example is the Big Bang, this theory of the Big Bang. So the most basic laws of the scientific you know, inquiry is the law of cause and effect. Everything you see has been caused by some previous uh, event. You know, and every event uh, leads to a subsequent event. So the most basic law of all in science is cause and effect. And somehow they expect us to tell, they expect us to believe that there was only one exception to this, and that's the Big Bang. There was no time when that happened, there was no space when it happened, and suddenly everything came from nothing. So there was there was no cause, there was just an effect. And they expect us to believe that. I mean, in comparison to that, you know, the virgin birth, you know, is a piece of cake. But that's where we start with science. So we're starting absolutely with this huge, huge act of faith. Now, how they arrive at this position is like, imagine, you know, you saw, you're coming up from San Francisco and you see a guy walking along the road. You meet him in Petaluma and he's walking northwards. 
and you drive beside him and you're photographing, videotaping his journey. And finally, he arrives in Hillsburg. So you've taped him all the way from Petaluma to Hillsburg. And now you have a movie. And now you play it backwards and you see him going from Hillsburg back down to Roner Park, back down to Petaluma. And then you infer on the basis of your video, he must have come from San Francisco. So you keep reversing the movie. The movie only shows you what happened between Petaluma and, and Hillsburg, but you're going to get retroactively infer that he must have started much earlier. And that's what the Big Bang Theory is. We have this movie of reality that we play backwards. And then we believe that that actually tells us that there was a Big Bang and that created everything. So it's um it's a fiction acting asking for an extraordinary level of faith. Morning, Josh. Good to see you, buddy. So, so there's the Big Bang. I believe that um pure mathematics is the queen of all the sciences. You know, it's absolutely pristine. And so one would imagine that at least pure mathematics is not based on faith. It is it's based on five articles of faith. In 1889, a guy called Giuseppe Piano, an Italian mathematician, formulated the five axioms of number theory. And so all of pure mathematics, number theory particularly, is built on these five, five axioms. You know, now, uh, without these axioms, you can't build a consistent, complete uh, system. And so mathematicians have been trying, trying since the beginning of the 1900s to try to create a mathematical system which is not axiomatic in which you don't need a postulate that has to be taken on faith. And they thought they were going to get there. And then in 1931, a brilliant uh, Austrian uh, mathematician called Kurt Gordel uh, came up with what's called the, um, uh, the incompleteness theorem, where he demonstrated mathematically that it is not possible to create any axiomatic system without having at least one unproven postulate. You can't build from scratch. You've got to assume at least one postulate, if you assume one postulate, you build much more slowly, but it'll be much more consistent. If you start off with uh, Giuseppe Piano's five postulates, you can build much more quickly, but it is less consistent. But you cannot get by without at least one postulate. And Godel proved that it's not just we're not able to do it yet, it cannot be done. It cannot be done mathematically. You can't build a man an axiomatic mathematical system without having at least one postulate that you have to take on faith. Now, this is true that when you extend that, it is true of any axiomatic system. And so philosophy is an axiomatic system. And so even philosophy cannot be built from scratch. Philosophy is built on an article of faith or several articles of faith. Now, Godel's incompleteness theorem models the, uh, the famous Heisenberg uncertainty principle that you find in quantum mechanics, where Heisenberg's uncertainty principle says you can't simultaneously know the location and the momentum of a subatomic particle. You have to freeze one in order to determine the value of the other. So you can't do both. You know, you got to start, you got to freeze one. It knows you have to start with a postulate. So in physics, you've got the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and in mathematics, the incompleteness theorem showing that you cannot build a scientific model without there being at least one postulate that you have to take on faith. Now I go back another 2000 years back to geometry and to Euclid. And Euclid created his geometrical system on what he called the five elements. And there were five postulates on which he built his geometrical system. You know, and the problem is they, they appear to be self-evident, but you can't prove any of them. So one of them, for instance, is that uh, one postulate of Euclidean geometry is that the, straight, the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. And that seems to be obvious to everybody. It's a straight line. You cannot prove it. There is no geometrical or mathematical way to prove that that actually is true. So you have to take these five kind of elements of Euclidean geometry in order to wreck this extraordinarily important scheme. But you can't prove the existence of any of these axioms. And as I showed yesterday, when you talk about language, even our usage of language, you know, according to Ferdinand de Saussure, there are three basic elements to language. There's the referent, the object in the real world that you're trying to describe. And from that referent, you create an internalized image that he called the signified. And it's a multi-sensory image, it's part tactile, part olfactory, part you know, uh, visual, part auditory. Uh, so the signified is a representation of the referent. But we have no idea actually what's out there because where the sensorium in our perception is translating electromagnetic signals and Boolean algebra into images in your own head which you then transfer to another person using signifiers. And so you got a problem. You have no idea what the referent is. 
and therefore you have no idea that the signified is a map of the referent, and you have no idea that the words you're using are understood by the listener in the, way, say, in the very same way that you're using them. And so even ordinary language is predicated on faith. Faith that you're actually internalizing what's really out there, and faith that what you're communicating is understood by the listener in the way in which you are hoping it will be understood. So the entirety of the scientific effort is built on faith. And so when I hear, you know, materialistic, scientistic people thinking that, you know, religion is built on faith, but, you know, science is built on fact, that is not true. Science is built on faith as much as religion is built on faith. Um, so when I took, looked then at the kind of the shadow side of science, just like I looked at the shadow side of um, religion yesterday. So for the longest period of time, we were being told that 90% of our DNA is junk, absolutely useless as if nature ever creates junk. I was listening to um, an interview done with an American uh, astronaut who was on the uh, International Space Station uh, a few years ago, and he was interviewed and he was asked, uh, have you guys conducted any medical experiments in space? So free from the effects of gravity, have you conducted any uh, uh, medical scientific experiments? And he said, yeah, we did. And he was asked, then, what kind of results did you come up with? And he said, well, we identify that some of the junk DNA actually gets activated in outer space in the absence of gravity. It's like you have, we're in an environment where the constraints of gravity allow aspects of DNA to articulate and express themselves in a way they can on planet Earth. And that made perfect sense to me. We are, we are star beings. And so it takes a particular kind of environment in which to uh, induce or persuade uh, some kind of DNA to express itself in the same way that a daffodil hidden underground uh, needs a signal from the environment in order to produce a shoot and a flower. It's there in potentia, but it takes an environmental uh, kind of a change to kind of persuade it to articulate itself and manifest itself. And so this junk DNA is just waiting for the appropriate kinds of environments in which to express itself. But we are being lectured in the past that there's all this junk that somehow nature created, which is absolutely useless. And so, as I said yesterday, I talked about this great dream I had of the kind of the um, the cylindrical high rise with the kind of the elevator going up through it and the different floors, and the realization that I got that unless the inquiring mind is prepared to visit all of the rooms and all of the floors, we are radically inaccurate, inaccurate cartographers of reality and the scientific endeavor whether we're dealing with kind of mystical reality or we're dealing with, you know, kind of biology or geography or whatever, it needs to access all those altered states of consciousness and all those stages of consciousness before they can create any kind of an adequate map of reality. So that was, where am I at this stage? Okay, section C. Um, section D then I called it, uh, is, is it a big bang or is it a big bust? Now, throughout uh, the history of astronomy and astrophysics in particular, there have been very, very many different uh, kind of uh, theories about the, what's happening in the universe. So one version is, you know, there was a big bang and a huge explosion, and now there's a steady state, and the universe is going to remain, remain the same size forever and ever. That was called a kind of a steady state notion of the universe. And then there was a notion, no, 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 it's... Um, it's, it's oscillating, it's increasing and contracting, increasing and contracting. That was a second theory that, you know, lived for maybe two or three decades. And then there was a theory of uh, inflation, that the universe is expanding, and that's the kind of the current theory, that the universe is expanding at an extraordinary rate. And so that has been driven by some kind of dark energy. Now, the difference between dark energy and dark uh, matter is that dark matter is a form of gravity that's holding stuff together and pulling it back together. And dark energy is a force that's expanding the universe back out there. So are we experiencing a big bang, you know, a big rip or a big crunch? The big crunch was the belief system that somehow the universe is going to implode upon itself again and just right, right, go down to a singularity and we're kind of back where we started. So um, astronomy and astrophysics has wrestled with these notions now for, for many, many, many years. And so when you look at the, these data now, for instance, that the Earth is rotating at about 1,000 miles an hour at the equator. If you're standing on the equator, you're ro rotating at about um, 1,000 miles an hour because the circumference of the globe is 24,900 miles, you know, and um, it spins in 24 hours. So basically, you're doing 1,000 miles an hour if you're standing at the equator. Now, if you're at the North Pole, all you're doing is pirouetting. 
you're not kind of moving around, you're just pirouetting on a point. And so depending where you are north or south of the equator, you're traveling slower or faster as far as the rotation of the planet is concerned. So that's the planet itself rotating at a thousand miles an hour at the equator. Um, uh, our planet then is uh, circumambulating the sun at a rate of 66,000 miles an hour. So as we're moving around the sun in the course of a year, we're moving actually at 666,000 miles an hour. So add that to the, 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 the rotation. The sun is orbiting our galaxy at the rate of 400,000 miles an hour. So it's a third level of movement. And then our galaxy is moving in a straight line it's the only part of the universe that's not going in a circular motion. It's going in a straight line through to expansion. And it's moving at 2.2 million miles an hour. And so when you do the math on that, it is 105.6 million miles every day, the expansion rate of the universe, according to current theory. And it's going in all directions. So the universe expands twice as much every day than our distance from the sun. We're 93 million miles away from the sun. So the universe is expanding at twice that, twice that distance every day. So there's the inflationary model you know, of our cosmos that is expanding at that extraordinary rate. Now, the other theory was sometimes called the big crunch that is going to, it's actually going to stop inflating and start retracting and finally come back down to a, a pinhole as if there's some kind of a gigantic black hole at the center of the universe that's going to suck it all back in. You know, and that then uh, th th that may be caused by uh, a dark matter. That dark matter uh, does two things. In spite of the fact that you know that every element in the universe seems to be expanding and inflating further and further away, every galaxy is being held together, a quad galaxy. So even though the galaxies are moving away from each other at an extraordinary rate, within the galaxy is being held together at a constant rate. And the explanation for this is there must be some kind of dark matter some super gravitational force that's holding each galaxy together, even as the galaxies are, are going further and further apart from each other. So by the inflationary model, at some stage, the only galaxy we'll be able to see is the Milky Way galaxy, because the others will have moved so far away, we can't see them anymore, given the speed of light. So there's the big crunch model, there's the big bang model, you know, and there's the kind of the, uh, the expansory model. So that's, that's what I mean, is that a big bang or is a big bust? Section E here, I call it the chutzpah of science. So the, the most important thing to realize perhaps is the realization that the scientific model can never provide us with proof. It can provide us with possibilities and probabilities at, at high levels. You know, typically in, in scientific inquiry, they'll use a 95% probability model. So as you're setting up your experiments and as you're analyzing your data, you're looking for outcomes that could that are probably 95% probable, but they're never 100% probable because the scientific model cannot deliver proof. It can deliver probabilities. So that's the first thing to realize when we're, when we're dealing with, with science. Now, another element of the chutzpah here is the realization that there are areas of life to which science, the scientific method, when I'm talking about just an empirical kind of experimentation, it can say nothing. It can, it can say nothing about the meaning of life. It can tell you nothing about love. And so the scientific method per se can't tell us anything about those really, really important kinds of questions. You're left to a wisdom modalities at that stage, not knowledge modalities. And very often, materialistic science particularly will say that anything to which it can contribute is useless and unimportant to begin with. So, for instance, uh, mind and consciousness and God and prayer and parapsychology, they're totally useless phenomena. There's no point in wasting your time. And so it becomes really difficult for scientists to get funding uh, to um, experiment in these in areas because the materialistic science, right, they either don't exist or they're so totally unimportant that we shouldn't be wasting taxpayer, taxpayer money on these kinds of things. So it's a second issue with the, with the scientific model. The third one is the, called the experimenter effect. And even in kind of um, rigorous, controlled, double-blind, randomized experiment, the experimenter effect can kind of pierce through all those levels of security. And still, the experimenter's mindset can affect kind of the outcome of the experiment. And I have a great example of that. I have a very good friend, uh, Marilyn Schlitz, who is the director of science at the Institute of Pneumatic Sciences, which is just down the road here 
in uh, in Petaluma. And uh, Marilyn uh, is a, a really great uh, scient scientist. There's a lot of experimentation in uh, parapsychology. And at one stage, she invited the Bay Area skeptics to set up a, a scientific experiment on parapsychology using exactly the same protocol as she used. And they would have you know, witnesses in each other's laboratories to making sure there was no skull document on. They conducted parapsychological research using exactly the same protocols and developing the same analytical statistical models. And the Bay Area skeptics got no results and she got a great results. And their, her, her observers are in their laboratory and their observers are in her laboratory. So the mindset of the experimenters themselves can affect the outcome of the experimentation. And that's called the experimenter effect. So even controlled double blind randomized experiments are not immune yet to this experimenter effect. That's a, a, another kind of a drawback for the scientific model. The next one is called the file drawer effect. And this unfortunately is really prevalent in pharmaceutical research where um, uh, experimentation that don't give the results expected are put into a file drawer. So when you do a meta-analysis looking at all of the experimentation in a particular field, you're drawing only upon the successful experiments. And so you're skewing the results. And that's called, in, in research, that's called the file drawer effect. And then you have the placebo. Uh, this notion that, you know, the realization that the mind affects, if you're given a placebo in the belief that this is a real medicine, 30% of the effect of any kind of pill is a placebo, at least 30%. Some people would say maybe 50% is the placebo, that you're going to have the desired effect because of what you believe the pill to carry, even if the, the pill is kind of a, a sugar pill. Now, instead of investigating the placebo effect and utilizing it, you know, we poo-poo it and say it's unimportant. So the placebo effect can be a hugely important tool in scientific inquiry. And uh, I would say then that Ultimately, the scientific uh, method is another form of storytelling. And that's not to deride it in any way. You know, I, I really believe very impo importantly in the, in the power of story. So a story is a kind of a tale with particular kinds of um, parameters and rules to it. Just like any game you play. You play um, American football and there's a particular set of rules. There's a certain number of players there's a certain shape ball. There are certain rules that have to happen. And then you get on, you know, half a mile away and you go to a soccer field. It's a different shape ball. There are different rules. You can't handle the ball except you're the goalkeeper. You can't go offside. You know, then you go and you play you know, baseball and it's a different size ball, different kinds of uniforms, different rules. So each, each game, if you understand what the rules are, then it's totally consistent within those sets of rules. So if you accept the postulates and the rule and methodology, it's going to make perfect sense. And the same thing is true of storytelling. If you accept the storytelling parameters and methodology, it delivers very consistent, you know, important results to you. If you accept the storytelling of the scientific model you know, and you accept its rule keeping, its protocols, and, you know, and its uh, uh, inquiry method, it is completely consistent with its own parameters. And therefore, it will deliver results, you know, which will you know, prove to itself that it, it's true. So we have to be really careful. What game am I playing? And what are the rules of this game? What postulates am I taking aboard? What protocols am I adopting? Because I'm only going to get the results which are consistent with the rules, you know, that I'm playing playing by. So the scientific inquiry needs to you know, realize that that's part of, of the deal here. Now, unfortunately, very, very often, materialistic science will tell us that God is dead, religion is irrelevant, the soul does not exist, there's no meaning to life, there is no such thing as teleology, life is not purposefully driven, it's kind of meaninglessly going nowhere, you know, so eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And so that, in some senses, we are a, ra a random accident, you know, that of all the universes and all the planets out there, life only appeared on this one planet and it's been driven inexorably by uh, random choices by nature, uh, blindly going nowhere. And so um, some of the great mystical scientists like Max Planck, I think he won the Nobel uh, Science Prize about 1922 or, or so. And Max Planck said famously, he's one of the founders of quantum theory, that um, uh, science develops or evolves one funeral at a time that the old guard has to die off between newer scientists you now begin to uh, accept newer kinds of uh, possibilities in their inquiries. And so uh, Thomas Kuhn wrote a very famous book called The Structure of Scientific Revolution, where he talked about the fact that literally science itself needs to undergo periodic revolutions in order to discard old thinking 
you know, and embrace new possibilities. So that's what I'd say then about the, uh, the, the, the chutzpah. So in some senses then, science is a modern religion, having all the same kinds of uh, paraphernalia as fundamentalist religion had. So they got their own saints. We call them Nobel laureates. They got their own scriptures. We call them peer-reviewed journals. They got their own vestments. We call them lab coats. They got their own uh, liturgy. We call it um, the scientific experimentation methodology. They got their own excommunication. You know, you can't get tenure or you can't get funding if you're experimenting with stuff which is outside the box that they don't want you to be messing around with. And it's infallible. You know, that the results, you know, either the results are infallible or at least the methodology itself is self-correcting and therefore it is infallible. So it gives itself a kind of a prophylactic absolution for any curtain mistakes in the belief system that it will rectify it, you know, next year or the year afterwards. So it's another form of religion. And when you realize that, you realize that it can be a spirituality or it can be a fundamentalism, depending on how you uh, re respond and engage with it. So uh, there was a very beautiful book written a few years ago by an English biologist. He was actually the director of, of uh, science at uh, IONS, the Institute of Genetic Sciences, down the road here for many years, a guy called Rupert Sheldrake. And he wrote a, a very famous book about 10 years ago, uh, mm -hmm. where he's talking about how scientific theories become laws. In other words, if you repeat a theory frequently enough, people regard it as an immutable law, when in fact it was just a hypothesis. And he gives a list of ones where, you know, we're still dealing with hypotheses and kind of theories that have been you now kind of set in the concrete of, of law. So one such theory that has become law is that nature is simply a machine and that plants and animals and human beings are just machine parts. It's basically a billiard table and the big bang set the balls in motion and now you can estimate exactly where each ball is going to wind up. And so basically it's a machine you know, acting itself out. Number two, nature has no consciousness until it emerged somehow in some animal or some human brain. Uh, kind of the illusion of consciousness emerged from biochemical and neurological activity in the brain. Number three, nature's laws were fixed at the Big Bang and nothing can change them. That is a theory. It is not a law. There's evidence, in fact, that the, uh, that the speed of light actually changes. You know, uh, very, very small. It's almost in detect, but it has changed, you know. And so this notion that the laws were set in motion and there's no way that they can change. That was a theory, which is now enshrined as a law. Number four, the belief that the total amount of matter and energy in the universe is fixed. You can't create extra matter and you can't create extra energy, nor can you destroy energy or matter. You can only change its state. That's a theory. And now it's become a law. There's no way of proving that to be true. Number five, Nature is purposeless and evolution is blind. It's going nowhere. It has no trajectory. It has no end point in mind. And it's blundering along through kind of random mutation and kind of uh, selection of the fittest. That's the only kind of driving force here. That's a theory and that is not a law, but it has become a law. Number six, biological inheritance is purely material via DNA. Everything we have in our bodies was gifted us materially through our DNA. There was no other source, you know, of um, the blueprint being evolved or changed, apparently from what's stored in this DNA, 90% of which is junk, according to that. Number seven, memories are stored materially in the brain. The belief system that the hippocampus stores memories, it stores the data, and the amygdala stores the emotional attachments to the data. And so it's, it's, within the, it's in the brain not outside the brain. Number seven, psychic phenomena are an illusion because a mind confined within the brain cannot affect anything else at a distance. So that, that has now become a law, a, a theory become a law. Number nine, mind is an epiphenomenon of the brain. The illusion is created within the brain. Number nine and number 10, mechanistic medicine, surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy are the only kinds of medical interventions that work. So no, no kind of wise women, no kind of naturopathy, discard all of that. Now, obviously, uh, mechanistic medicine has extraordinary abilities, but it's not, not the whole picture. So here's a whole bunch then of theories that get repeated so frequently that they become laws. And your average person, when they hear it, yeah, that's obvious, we know that. Um, it is not fact whatsoever. It's a theory subject to change with new empirical data. So that uh, section G. Number H, then I want to mention some major faux pas that science has made, some serious 
really important scientists making really dumb remarks. Thomas Jefferson was a brilliant man. I think it was um, it was uh, John F. Kennedy who said one time that he had a group of uh, top scientists meeting with him at the White House, and he says, this is probably the greatest you know, um, meeting of uh, intelligence that ever happened in this house since Thomas, Jefferson, since Thomas Jefferson was here on his own. Yeah, so a brilliant, brilliant man. But here's what he said. Through uh, Connecticut, um, astronomers discovered meteorites. And when uh, Jefferson became aware of that, he said, I would rather believe that two Yankee astronomers would tell lies rather than stones fall from the sky. Couldn't believe it. Yeah, this is a brilliant guy. Lord Kelvin, this great uh, British uh, a scientist responsible for many, many interventions of his own, said very famously in 1895, heavier than air objects cannot fly. End of discussion. Enough of this, Michigas. 1895, it's in 1903 that they, the Wright brothers you know, flew for the first time. In 1900, the same Lord Kelvin, who was a pompous ass, to, it seems, said that x-rays are a hoax. You cannot see inside the human body. It was 1900. Uh, in 1900 as well, the, maybe the most famous, famous faux pas he ever came up with was, he said, nothing new, there is nothing new to be discovered in physics. Nothing new. All we are doing now is kind of, kind of, uh, kind of tweaking the formula. That's all that needs to happen in physics. That was 1900. Uh, a very famous French scientist called Pierre Prochet, who was professor of physiology in Toulouse University, said the germ theory of disease is poppycock. There's no such thing. There's no such thing as a tiny elemental uh, bacteria that can affect the health of a human being. And the, uh, the Surgeon General to um, uh, Queen Victoria, a guy called Sir John Eric Erickson, in 1837 opined, although he was a surgeon, that there were three areas of the human body that could never be opened up through surgery that would lead to instant death. And that was the abdomen, the chest, and the brain. They could never be, be operated on. And... Uh, the uh, director of the U.S. Patent Office, a guy called Charles Quell, in 1899, was trying to persuade Pres President William McKin McKinley to shut down the Patent Office because he said that everything that could possibly be discovered has already been discovered. So he wanted to shut the whole thing down. And even Einstein, the great, greatest genius maybe of the 20th century, you know, on encountering a quantum mechanical, the notion of uh, quantum entanglement, he called it spooky action at a distance. And he spent the last part of his life trying to dispute quantum mechanics. And he had these famous debates constantly with the great quantum physicists. And so, you know, there's some major faux pas being made by extraordinary minds in science, in the very same way that allegedly infallible popes have created inquisitions and crusades as well. So there's no area of human inquiry which is not, not subject to kind of making major mistakes. So some of the mortal and venal sins of this of science, I just mentioned one or two. So it's because of our scientific know-how that it is possible for us to actually plunder the planet right now, which is what we're doing in so many areas. You know, they're not doing that in the Amazon. You know, tribes of 250 people in the Amazon are not plundering the planet, are not even capable of plundering the planet, but we can do it in so many different guises. We have developed weapons of mass destruction, which are literally capable of blowing the planet into smithereens. Literally, we could be creating another kind of asteroid belt out of our own planet, courtesy of the, the scientific system. So I just mentioned that one piece. Now, I noticed when I was reviewing my notes this morning that I'd cover the next section, a transhumanism. I actually covered it yesterday, transhumanism and the cities. So I'm going to give that a skip today and go on to the gifts of science. And the gifts of science are myriad. So our communication technologies are absolutely amazing. Uh, our transport modalities are absolutely amazing. Our ability in kind of, of medicine to treat acute illnesses is absolutely amazing. And so uh, the, this scientific model is really, really beautiful. I heard a lecture many years ago by a guy called Bernard Hesch in Palo Alto, and he came up with this theory called creation by subtraction which is a beautiful scientific understanding that we actually, we create by subtracting that which is relevant to the inquiry. And the example I would give is, if you go into a movie theater, you know, and you're projecting an image onto a screen, 
you know, so uh, the light is coming through a reel and you see a screen right in front of you and it's magnified 40 feet by 30 feet. And you're looking at, you know, John Wayne riding across the stage on his, on his horse. Now, the part you're seeing actually is the part that's not there. What's coming through is white light. And the white light has been obfuscated, you know, by the smudges on the, the film. And the smudges on the film are denying light to the, to the screen. And what you're looking at is where the light doesn't exist. And that's the image that you're seeing. You're, a, you're unaware of the light around it anymore, and you're focused on the place the light does not exist. So the images are created by the absence of the light. So he called that creation by subtraction. And so basically, uh, what you're taking to be reality is where the light is actually missing. And that's kind of a modern version of Plato's cave. You know, you're looking at images projected onto a, a cave wall, and you think that that's ultimate reality. Now, the scientific inquiry can tell us that very, really beautifully. We have to realize, you know, that what we're actually looking at is the part that isn't there. And that gives us extraordinary knowledge about the light. So that's a beautiful kind of a, a gift that science gives to us. There was a very famous American scientist called John Wheeler. I think he lived up to about a year 100. And unfortunately, he never got a, a Nobel Prize. I think he deserved a Nobel Prize. And he, as many of his students did, Richard Feynman, people like that, got Nobel Prizes. But John Wheeler was in a, I think he was in a category of his own. But he invented a form of 20 questions. Did you play that as kids where, you know, so there's three of us in, in a room, you know, and one guy sent out the room, Annika sent out of the room, and then we decide we're going to think of something. And then Annika comes in and she's got 20 questions to try to figure out what it is we decided upon. And if she, if she asks really good questions and we give consistent, truthful answers, she may be able to figure out, you know, after uh, question number 15, what the object is. Wheeler created a much more complex version of that. So there are three of us in the room, you know, and we send one person out, we're going to send Josh out, and we're going to say, we're going to think of something, and you're going to have to figure out what we're thinking of. And then Leela and I, or, or uh, Fred and I, we decide we're not going to think of anything. Well, he's, he's not going to know that. He's going to come in, and he's going to start asking questions, and we haven't picked out anything. If he's really, really good, and he asks, asks really good questions, and we give consistent, truthful answers, he'll force us to pick something we hadn't thought about until finally we arrive, you know, at an object, and he was, ah, I found out what you were thinking, and we weren't thinking of anything. He can actually force us into creating a reality that didn't previously exist. That was his version. Now, that's the genius of the scientific method, that very, very often, you know, by asking the wrong kinds of questions, scientists figure out what the right questions might be, you know, and by, as uh, Polonius very famously said in Hamlet, by indirection, find direction out. So this is the genius of the scientific method, you know, that when scientists examine, create questions, you know, and then, you know, evaluate the responses to the questions, they can actually force the universe to cough up real answers, maybe answers that the universe didn't even have in mind before the questioning began. So that's the genius of science. And the great virtues of real scientists for me are the following. The first one is patience, that the really great scientists are extraordinarily patient people. You'll have some scientists who'll spend 15, 20, 30 years working on a theory and then finally crack it. But they'll stay with the process because they've been driven by this search for truth. They have created a model which is self-correcting in fairness to them. Uh, real science will correct itself much more quickly than a real religion will correct itself. It took 500 years for the church to forgive a Galileo. You know, science does that much more, much more quickly. So it's a self-correcting and much speedier fashion. It always keeps its eye on the destination. It's like an unerring GPS system. It's like when I'm driving my car, no matter how many times I, I take the wrong turn and I don't listen to what my GPS is telling me, it'll always presume, I presume you still want to go to the same de destination. So now I'm going to give you different directions because you didn't take the directions I, I gave you. And now you're going to get really, really lost. So I'm going to give you a totally new set of directions to get you to where you said you want to go. And that's the genius of the scientific method. It's a GPS system which always keeps its eyes on the destination. It has an extraordinary commitment to the search. No matter how many times the rug is pulled out from underneath a great scientist and they have to abandon a theory, having spent years and years and years pursuing one life line of inquiry to realize that it didn't work. I think that's where, for instance, where string theory is headed right now. I think, you know, it is, um, it is not falsifiable 
there is no way of falsifying string theory. And therefore, it's not even strictly speaking uh, an adequate scientific theory because the essence of science and scientific theory is that it has to be falsifiable. And as it exists right now, string theory is not falsifiable. And so there are great scientists who spend 20 years on, you know, trying to get work with string theory. And I think they're going to be really disappointed. Yeah, but they'll shift and they'll say, okay, didn't work. Let's focus on some other theory. So the, the ability to kind of stay com committed uh, to the search. The humility uh, to realize, yeah, okay, um, we came to wrong conclusions. Yeah, I screwed up here. So let me change my kind of approach, you know, and uh, adopt a different approach. The extraordinary ability to trust their imaginations. And as I said uh, yesterday, there's a huge difference between imagination and fantasy. Fantasy is the ability to make up st stuff that's real, that's not real. Imagination is the ability to enter a uh, volitionally an altered state of consciousness, you know, uh, engage with entities and energies in those other states, learn from them and bring it back. And so there's a famous story told about uh, um, uh, Einstein when he was being kind of the president of Princeton was trying to persuade him to come to the States and work you know, in, in Princeton. And uh, this guy had seduced many, many great scientists from all over the world. And he would equip them with any kind of laboratory equipment they wanted, tens of thousands of dollars, no, no problem. Tell me what you want and we'll get it for you. And so he's talking to Einstein and trying to persuade him to come to the States. And he says, Professor Einstein, uh, what do you need in your laboratory? And Einstein says, well, I need a comfortable chair. Uh, and I need a desk and um um, uh, lots of uh, yellow pads and um, uh, a bunch of pencils. And the guy said, and, 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 and what else? He says, no, no, that's it. And that was it. That for Einstein, what he would do, he would sit on a photon of light and travel at the speed of light into interstellar space and just look around him and see what did he see. So he's using his imagination. And that's the kind of the, uh, that's a quality of a great scientist, using the imagination to go where no one has gone before and to trust that the imagination is going to deliver great insights. And then finally, I would say that the really great scientists have a partial for a sharing their data that um, some of them will not, obviously, but most of them are prepared to share their data and be collaborative so that they can build upon each other and learn from each other. It's like the kids telling, telling stories where I tell one line, Karen takes the second line, you know, Annika takes the next line and we build upon each other's work that these are the great virtues of, of, of real scientists. And then some of the, uh, the really important findings very, very briefly before we run out of time. I think quantum mechanics and uh, biocentrism particularly have been major, major contributions to the scientific inquiry over the last hundred years. Biocentr biocentrism just very, very recently. Biocentrism is the, the uh, scientific uh, theory that um, matter is an artifact of consciousness rather than consciousness being an artifact of matter. And so it's uh, uh, the, the cosmos is life-based, you know, not matter-based. And uh, so I just pick two, two elements of uh, quantum mechanics and end with those pieces. The first is the notion of what is called quantum tunneling, this extraordinary ability of uh, protons within the hydrogen atom to penetrate each other. It's called fusion. And it's the, re re the re it's the reason that there's light emanating from the sun. So this kind of this huge nuclear reactor that we call the sun, there's this fusing of hydrogen atoms that interpenetrate and they release light. And it is that light which is responsible for all life on planet Earth. Now, unfortunately, it can be used then to create a nuclear bomb. It's the same idea, the fusion uh, of uh, subatomic particles that create these massive explosions. But there would be no life on planet Earth if it weren't for this extraordinary uh, uh, quantum tunneling. Now, in some senses, I believe that, so we typically think that when two solid objects encounter each other, they bounce off each other or they make an indentation and then fly apart. Now, life itself kind of uh, gives the light to that. When a sperm and an egg meet, they don't bounce off each other, they penetrate and all life comes from that union. So in some senses, the most fundamental form of quantum quantum tunneling, I believe, you know, is the, the act of lovemaking and the penetration of a, a sperm into an egg. And so we have evidence of quantum tunneling, you know, from the, from the beginning of light. But it has extraordinary effects that life generated from the sun and life generated, germinated from human activity. And the sec one of the second great kind of um, results of uh, quantum theory is kind of, it's called superposition. You know, Andrea is a dancer. 
I defy Andrea to stand in the middle of a floor, you know, and spin in two opposite directions at the same time. So you can spin counterclockwise and then stop and then spin clockwise afterwards, but you can't spin clockwise and anticlockwise at the same time. Now, a, a superposition in quantum mechanics does exactly that. It spins in both directions at the same time. Now, and this is an extraordinary ability. And so uh, the, the reason we have MRI machines is that an MRI machine spins all of the hydrogen atoms in the human body in opposite directions at the same time, allowing us to see three-dimensionally inside the human body. And so this extraordinary superposition, this ability of hydrogen atoms to be detected by this machine and to force the hydrogen atoms to spin in both directions at the same time allows us you know, to see you know, what's inside the human body. So these extraordinary medical benefits from uh, scientific inquiry. Now, this superposition, I believe, I like to extrapolate that and say that that's not just true of our, our machinery. A superimposition also is a facet in, I believe, in reasoning, in ratiocination, and in a logical kind of inference and deduction. And so, for instance, the Greeks had a binary approach uh, to logic. Something was either true or false, you know? So you could very figure, quickly figure out there was only two options. Either a proposition is true or a proposition is false. Buddhism had a totally different hiddenness. So Buddhist, you know, uh, when Buddhism talks about the mind, it's a much more expanded version of mind than the Greeks. So in Buddhism, something had, can be in one of four conditions. It can be true. It can be false. It can be neither true nor false. And it can be both true and false. And so when you're working with a Buddhist notion of the body, you know, uh, all of these conditions are true. And very kind of painfully, I try to come up with a metaphor to try to explain, you know, this to myself. And so you look at the chicken and the egg paradox, which came first, the chicken or the egg. And so at some stage, you know, when you look at this thing, uh, is this a chicken or an egg? And I say, it's an egg. And you say, yeah, it's true. It's an egg. And I say, no, there's a, there's a chicken. There's a little baby kind of an ovum inside in that. And you say, well, prove it to me. So at some stage, it's only an egg. And when it's broken out of the shell, it's only a chicken. There's not an egg left anymore. So that would be the Greek model. You know, it's either an egg or it's a chicken, but it can't be both. But at some stage during the gestation, it's both an egg and a chicken. There's a little chick inside in the egg. So it's both, it's true and it's false. It's a chick and it's an egg at the same time. And finally, you know, when it gets out of the shell, you know, and unfortunately it's slaughtered, it's neither a, a chick nor an egg. So it can be uh, true, false, both true and false, or neither true nor false. So this is the great genius of the, uh, the Buddhist mindset. Mindset. So let me just finish then with the kind of, um, uh, the kind of, uh, I said this in a hot I mean, two or three years ago during Easter. There's a great uh, book called Flatland, written in the 1880s by a guy called Abbot Abbot, in which he talks about a three-dimensional reality encountering a two-dimensional reality. And so imagine you got this, you got this book here, this page, it's a plane, it's a two-dimensional reality. And so everything that exists on that, you know, is only two-dimensional. It could be a straight line, it could be a circle, it could be a triangle, it could be a square, you know, but it's only, it's only a two-dimensional reality. It consists of lines of various kinds. And all of a sudden, I bring, you know, a ball down uh, uh, towards it, you know, and the people on this page cannot see that. They cannot see into a third dimension. And so this three-dimensional genius so, somehow manages to make a convert of a two-dimensional creature and says, there is a third dimension, and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to penetrate this page with this ball, this three-dimensional ball. And initially, all you're going to see is a dot on the page. And then the dot will expand into a circle and the circle will get bigger and bigger and bigger as I'm passing through the page. And then as I pass through the page, the circle will get smaller and smaller and smaller. And finally, there'll be a dot and then it'll be, boom, it's gone. And that'll prove to you, you know, I'm penetrating this page. And he makes the convert and this convert in the two dimension uh, can, can join it and actually can appreciate it. Nobody else in the page can do it. And so as a gift, the three dimensional reality takes the two dimensional kid into the third dimension to live there. And the kid is really delighted. And the kid says, you know, if there's a third dimension, there must be a fourth dimension and a fifth dimension. And the third dimension guy says, stupid, poo, 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 poo. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Can't happen like that. Okay, so we're locked into our own dimensionality. Now, I really believe when I see this story of the resurrection, where Jesus appears in a room to the disciples, they're locked in the room because they're, they're afraid they're going to wind up being crucified like Jesus was. And all of a sudden, he's inside the room. 
and the doors are locked. So what happened? You had quantum tunneling. You had somebody in a three-dimensional reality, temporarily inhabiting a four-dimensional reality, passing through solid walls, you know, disassembling his atomic structure outside, reassembling his atomic structure inside, and boom, there he is inside in the room. And they're shocked to see him. Now, if you were a, a two-dimensional being watching, a, a, um, let's say, a dot approaching a solid wall, which is impenetrable at a two-dimensional level, and it comes up to this wall, and if you were a dimensional, two-dimensional creature, you could not penetrate this wall. And all of a sudden, this dot meets, reaches the wall, and then suddenly it's at the other side, moving away from the wall. And you how the hell did it do that? And how it did it was, it temporarily elevated into a third dimension, went over the wall, descended on the other side, and kept going. And so in some senses, that my understanding of resurrection, that Jesus kind of encountered the wall, <laughs> Went into the fourth dimension, disassembled his atomic structure, came inside, re reassembled his atomic structure, and now appeared on the inside of the wall. And so resurrection for me is kind of the ultimate demonstration of a superposition. So that's what I'll say about science from this morning. That's a lot of questions. Brilliant. The first one having to do with the, the placebo effect. Can I talk about the placebo and the opposite, which is called the no nocebo effect? And the second question you had to do with um, the activation of junk DNA in space. So let me just talk about those two. So the first one, obviously, and placebo is just a Latin phrase, which means I will. Yes, I will. And so it's in some senses, you're saying yes to the possibilities inherent in the kind of the medical intervention. Nocebo means I won't. And literally, it is if you expect a bad outcome from a kind of an intervention, you're going to demonstrate it. And so I give you a typical example. You can literally, and this has been demonstrated literally medically, you can hypnotize somebody, put them in a hypnotic state, you know, and tell them that you're going to hold a burning match against their skin. And you literally take an ice cube and put it up against their skin and they're hypnotized and they'll develop blisters as if they'd been burned, literally. And so the body is going to marshal the appropriate response to the kind of the assault. Because what we don't realize very often, particularly in Western medicine, that symptomology is evidence for the body doing the best thing it can to deal with the insult it's just experienced. That symptoms, you know, are not so much indicative of an underlying problem as they are indicative of the body's innate healing mechanism. And so, in, for instance, in homeopathy, what you're trying to do is kind of accelerate and amplify the symptomology. When somebody demonstrates a, a symptom, the homeopathic response is accelerate and amplify that response because that's evidence that the body is actually healing itself. And so the body is going to marshal its resources to deal with the, the perceived insult. And if the perception is, it's been told, I'm going to put a hot match against your skin. It will marshal the appropriate response to a burning sensation, although in actual fact, it's an ice cube that's been demonstrated there. So if you believe that bad stuff is going to happen, it will. And so one of the mistakes, for instance, that you know, people who are dealing with you know, life-threatening illnesses and the doctor says, I give you six weeks to live. And the person dies you know, five weeks and six days later. So giving this message to somebody, you know, you know, I'm an expert and I can see the future and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. And then you accommodate and you marshal the body's activities all unconsciously. Say, so, okay, here's the, the, the result we need to get a uh, engineer right now. Uh, let's give up and die. Because the body can only do two things. It can respond to two signals, grow or defend. They're the only two signals a cell understands, grow or defend. And so if the mind is told that the body is under assault, the system closes down, cell activity stops, cell activity stops, and defense kicks in, which means the immune system is compromised immediately. Uh, when the body is well, the signal is getting the, the, the injunction, grow, develop, you know, evolve constantly. So the nocebo then is the body responding to a negative message, whereas the placebo is responding to a positive message. So it's evidence that it's the body that heals itself. Medical interventions you know, may accelerate any particular uh, physiological process, but they're not occasioning it. So that's kind of the, no, the nocebo. Uh, so the second piece then you talked about was, you know, what about uh, uh, junk DNA being activated in outer space? And you added the question, uh, Kevin, about, uh, about a baby in utero. It doesn't seem to be subject to the same gravitational forces. It's literally doing back back backflips inside the amniotic fluid. So obviously there's a lessened sense of, of a, a gravitational pull. 
And I believe to answer your question, I hadn't thought about it, but it's a great question. Obviously, that's how the baby's the DNA is getting activated in utero. It's in, a, in an environment in which, you know, there is no junk DNA at that stage that it's activating as much of the DNA as it can during that nine month period when it's not subject as much to gravitational kind of constraints. So when you go into outer space, then you have the gravitational kind of a limitation taken away from it. I think you're also much more exposed to cosmic energies. And so Andre was telling us yesterday about you know the fact that we're moving into a very special place in the planet's rotation right now. And there have been theories out there since the kind of the 1987 that the uh, our, our solar system is moving through a part of the Milky Way galaxy in which we're being subject to much more healing kinds of energetic impulses. And so when you think the the um, the Milky Way galaxy is it basically looks like a disk, but it's a disk that's you know several million miles thick, so it's a very thick disk. And so our solar system is like a merry-go-round. You know, when you go to a merry grounds and you get up one of these horses on the carousel and it's going round and round and round the circles, except as kids, it wasn't going around in a circle. The horse was going up and down. You remember that? That activity? That's what our solar system is doing within the Milky Way galaxy. It's not just circumambulating the black hole at the center of the galaxy. It's actually cresting, you know, and it's like a sine wave up and down over millions and millions of years. And so it means that where our solar system is experiencing very different kinds of energies from the galaxy itself, because it's a different part of the band, you know, which consists, which contains the Milky Way galaxy. So my, my sense then is that it's not just gravitational constrictions being really relieved. It's that we're in a in an energy field which is different at this stage and which is kind of accelerating you know, kind of the awakening of Homo sapiens sapiens. My belief system is that this is the meeting point. This is why I, I entitled uh, this uh, series Mis uh, Mysticists, the next stage of human evolution, that is going to be the conjoining of great science with uh, mystical spirituality, that that's where the future lies. And it means the abandonment of fundamentalist science, materialistic science, and the abandonment of fundamentalist religion. And I'll actually talk about that in the next lecture as well. What are the kind of the, the hallmarks of fundamentalism in any modality? And obviously, in order to survive as a planet right now, there needs to be a meeting of these two great kind of uh, methodologies, the mystical methodology and the scientific inquiry. Uh, and the realization then that we have to share this and that there will be people who are well versed in both systems, what uh, Carl Jung would call Gnostic intermediaries that have both scientific know how, you know, and mystical experiences, and therefore that they can cross fertilize it and like then become teachers for the rest of us. You know, none of us can be experts in everything. And so somebody is going to be an expert in growing food for us. Somebody else is going to be an expert, you know, in engineering, you know, uh, motor cars for us. And so not everybody can be an expert in every arena, but we're certainly going to need a new kind of a, a brand of uh, of elders who are uh, really well versed in the scientific inquiry and the scientific knowledge and, and history and literature. And at the same time, well versed in mystical literature and have had mystical experiences and that there will be that will be their function in society to alert us to that a level of reality, you know, and the farmers then can continue do with farming, you know, and the bus driver can continue driving buses, but they're living in a reality now, which is very different because, you know, they're not making the old, they're making assumptions now and they're building their life on the reality of the existence of, of God or a spirit or source. And so life is being remythologized, re you know, we have desacralized life. Uh, in, in modern times, basically since the alleged enlightenment in the 1700s, we have basically desacralized life. Now we need to resacralize it, remythologize our storytelling, and that will be the function of uh, these mysticists. You know, and then the rest of us are going to learn from those and do what we what we do otherwise, whatever job we come to do to do that. Yeah, great observation, Willie. Thank you. Yeah. So Andrea's comment was about uh, the importance of bringing emotions to bear on rational decision-making process, that it's not enough just to choose between A and B, 
that there has to be some level of passion or some kind of emotion, you know, driving uh, your behavior. You can always change your decision uh, if uh, it doesn't work out the way you want it. But that for me is evidence of the fact that we're constructed at many, many different levels. And so making a decision on a rational basis using the left brain only is going to have a half a decision. And making a decision that incorporates the uh, the right brain is also part of it. You kind of climbing aboard the astral body, the emotional body is part of it. Uh, uh, getting to the psychic levels uh, for input from the psychic level is important. So the more parts of the self we can engage with the decision making process, the more energy we're bringing to the to the decision, whether it's a you know whatever it is. And so passion is very very important in order to see through on any decision I do make. And so I find, end by saying that when you look at the um, even the organization of the physical brain, it's basically a triune brain, a reptilian system, which goes back, you know, millions and millions and millions and millions of years. And then a kind of a, a, a kind of a, the, the, uh, the mammalian brain, which is about 245 million years of age. And then the kind of the neocortex, which is about 70,000 years of age. And so in some senses, you know, our ability to think abstractly is the, the most recent part of us and not necessarily the wisest part of us. It has less time and less uh, experience to draw upon. Uh, the emotions have been there much, much, much longer than the uh, than neocortex has been. And so we need to realize that it has a wisdom and experience as far outweighing, not necessarily more important than, but a longer trajectory. And the reptilian brain has been there like, uh, since, uh, since the beginning. And so the physical body with the reptilian brain has, a, has experiences which are much, much older than the mammalian brain. So to the level, to the extent that we can engage all aspects of, of the brain in the process of decision making, we are more likely to come to the right, right solutions and to have the will and the passion to kind of uh, to see those through.